Holy City Center Radio is episode 136, and I am your host, Christian Sanger. Today is Friday, June 16th, 2023. Well, it's Friday, time for the weekend. Lots to look forward to. If you're looking for something to do, be sure to go to holycitycenter.com slash events. You can see what is going on in town this weekend. Be a nice way to cap off what I hope was a good week for you all. All sorts of things going on, like I always say, whether you want to be inside, outside, or a combination of both, there's plenty going on. Now, unfortunately, it is also a uh, tough, tough weekend uh, because we have some anniversaries of some tragic events that happened here in the Charleston area. And uh, although, you know, for absolutely go out, have fun, have a great weekend, but keep these two things in mind and the 18 people we have lost between these two tragedies, as well as the countless amount of people who are affected by both. Um, the first such anniversary uh, is on Sunday, June 18th. That is the Charleston 9 anniversary. For those who don't remember, the uh, Charleston Sofa Superstore uh, in West Ashley. There was a horrible disaster involving a fire that occurred on the evening of June 18th, 2007. Uh, it ended up resulting in the death of nine firefighters. And this always kind of shocks me, but it, it makes sense when you think about it. Uh, this was the deadliest firefighter disaster in the United States since the September 11th attacks back in 2001. And again, you, it's crazy to think that, but also makes sense because generally you know, firefighters aren't involved in, you know, in this extent of, you know, these horrific disasters. Uh, just, a, you know, I, it was, I think I moved here maybe a, a little less than a month after this tragedy and just remember how much it affected the town. Um, but yeah, so take a moment and to, to remember those folks uh, and their families and friends. Uh, the nine firefighters who passed that day are Louis Mulkey, Mike Benneke, Melvin Champagne, William Billy Hutchinson, Bradford Beatty, James Earl Drayton, Mark Kelsey, Michael French, and Brandon Thompson. The other tragic anniversary actually uh, will be marked on Saturday, so the day before. It's June 17th, and of course this is the anniversary of the horrific mass murder of multiple parishioners at the Emanuel AME Church in downtown Charleston. I, I can't believe it's getting to this point, but it, it's been since 2015. That's eight years. It, I, it, it simultaneously seems like a long time ago and also like it just happened. Um, that was one of the most surreal times being in Charleston. You know, the weird feeling after the Sofa Superstore fire. Uh, this was even more palpable being especially downtown, just that feeling in the days and weeks after the shooting, it was just, it's hard to explain unless you were here during that time, the feelings and the things that were going on and, you know, the crush of media that was in town for a while and the coverage and yeah, just, I, I can't think of anything, any other word besides surreal and, you know, just devastating uh, in the aftermath of, of the shooting. Um, so of course, we want to remember those folks as well, which uh, oddly, again, nine people, and I say that nine people that passed in both of these tragedies, obviously other people very much involved, um, especially when you think about the church shooting, that there was other people who survived that, including a child. But the nine uh, people who passed included uh, Reverend and he also State Senator Clementa Pinckney, Cynthia Graham Hurd, Susie Jackson. Ethel Lee Lance, DePayne Middleton Doctor, who was also a pastor, by the way, Tawanza Sanders, another pastor, Daniel L. Simmons, yet another pastor, Sharonda Coleman Singleton, and Myra Thompson. So again, this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, just the weird parallels between them. Nine people pass, obviously both tragedies in Charleston, although one in West Ashley portion of Charleston, the other downtown, but nine people in each tragedy that died and just a day apart as far as, you know, obviously different years, but just weird parallels between the two. And, um, I guess somewhat fittingly that, you know, we're honoring those folks, you know, every year around the same time. 
So there will be some events around town, you know, remembrances and things. So I'm sure you'll see those. But again, while you're having fun out there this weekend, uh, don't forget about those two tragedies in, in Charleston's re- very recent past and, and the folks that were affected and continue to be uh, to this day. Tough to transition out of that, but we will get into the latest news. So let's go ahead and move forward and get to some of the top headlines. The Charleston County School District has officially offered Dr. Eric Gallion the position of superintendent of the state's second largest school district. Board members met virtually on Wednesday for a specially called meeting to discuss the contract negotiations. After two hours of closed door deliberations, board members ended up voting publicly and offered him the job. The final vote tally was six to two, with Ed Kelly and Leah Watley voting against the motion. Both Kelly and Watley were Moms for Liberty back candidates when they were running for this position. Before the vote, uh, Watley said that she disapproved of the process after Galleon was the only candidate left when two other finalists dropped out of contention when their names leaked on a Facebook group online that they were finalists. Watley said she believes they should have opened up the job to more candidates. Uh, In the end, only her and Kelly were against offering the contract, and, and so there is a new superintendent coming to the Charleston County School District. Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley, of course, also South Carolina's former governor, said that if she becomes president, parentheses, LOL, she would pardon former president Donald Trump for crimes related to his improper handling of classified documents. That is, of course, if Trump is ultimately convicted and doesn't become president himself. Trump pleaded not guilty in federal court uh, in Miami on Tuesday to criminal allegations that he risked national security by mishandling classified documents and obstructed the government's efforts to reclaim those documents earlier this year. He is the first former president to be charged with federal crimes as he faces 37 counts connected with the removal, storage, and concealment of sensitive government documents he took from the White House upon leaving office in 2021. Now, Haley, besides being the former South Carolina governor, of course, was also ambassador to the United Nations under Trump and said and she said that she's in favor of granting Trump a presidential pardon if he is indeed convicted. She said in part, basically, that when you look at a uh, when you look at a pardon, this is her words. The issue is less about guilt and more about what's good for the country. She also went on to say she think it she thinks it would be terrible for the country to have a formal a former president in prison. Uh, for years because of the document's case. She said that that's something you see in a third world country. So that's right. Just, I don't even know if it was hours or a day after saying it was a weak uh, argument against Trump, but, you know, basically said that he was reckless with documents. And that was really her first like negative talking point related to the document's case. So just when it seemed like maybe she was inching towards going against him she pulls that right back and says she would pardon him putting aside the fact that all of the details of this case obviously are not out yet yes we've seen the indictment but the court case hasn't even started who knows what would come out who knows you know what evidence turns out to be accurate which maybe or which isn't maybe as accurate as we thought based on the indictment that's what court cases are for so putting all that aside that she has no idea how this is going to play out uh, this is just another example of how pathetic her, you know, campaign for president is, you know, it's been weak, hasn't really taken a strong position on much, much like Tim Scott. She's kind of fumbled when she's asked about abortion, hasn't really been able, although she's done a better job than Tim Scott has done and just continues to flail trying to find her footing. And it's it's like she simultaneously wants to say she's a better option than Trump, but also doesn't want to talk negatively about him and wants to make sure not to make his base upset. So while she'll make weak, you know, statements like, oh, he was reckless with documents, you know, but she won't, for, for God forbid, actually come out and say, hey, look, <laughs> you know, he might deserve to be punished or, hey, let's see how this court case, you know, goes through. Now, she's decided she wants to try to get in their good graces and say that she would pardon him. 
Now, her reason for doing so is ridiculous, uh, saying that pardons are less about guilt and more about what's good for the country. So it's basically saying, hey, if you're president, even if you're guilty of crimes, I think it'd be bad for the country to have you in prison. So we're going to pardon you. Like, what, what sense does that make? It shows, which many people in this country already believe, that those with wealth and power have a different standard than the rest of us. And so if you're president, you basically can commit whatever crime you want in Haley's mind because she thinks that, oh, it'd be bad to have the president in jail. Look, his supporters might think it's bad because they already think this is a witch hunt and all that. But the majority of the country, and also if you took his name out of it, so you don't even know who we're talking about, the majority of the country would say, hey, people who commit crimes deserve to face punishments for those. We are a country supposedly of law and order. And that's how these things work. If you you have your chance to defend yourself, you have your chance, you're innocent until proven guilty. But if you are proven guilty, you face punishment. Again, take the names out of it. And I think everybody would be in agreement. It's ridiculous to say, a president does, shouldn't go to jail because it'd be bad for the country. I think it'd be bad for the country if we continue to show that people who are wealthy, people with power, politicians, get away with stuff the rest of us would not get away with. Granted, we're talking about classified documents, and most of us wouldn't even have access to these, and so it's kind of a moot point in that sense. But all things being equal, you know damn well that we all would be going to jail if we have done the things that Trump is alleged to have done. And people have gone to jail. Um you know, for uh, there's a famous couple whose name eludes me who are convicted of spying, for, I think it was for Russia. And this is decades ago. So, yeah, the regular people go to jail and presidents, politicians, celebrities, whatever it is, should be held to that same standard. It's already ridiculous to me. We've seen so many examples, whether it was with Nixon, Clinton, you know, when he was going through his impeachment um, and, and now Trump, that they already rules. In, in regards to presidents are ridiculous, you know, like you can't indict a sitting president, which is crazy. Like if they commit a crime, they should be indicted. I know it might lead to some disruption in the government, but that's why we have a line of succession, a plan of succession. Someone can take over if need be. The rules around presidents are insane to me and need to be reexamined. And this is another one where it's not a rule, but she's basically saying she doesn't believe a president should go to jail. A former president. And I just, it's ridiculous. And just again, another example of why she is unfit to be president of the United States. Criminal defendants with repeat violent charges will soon have a harder time getting out of jail as they await trial and could spend more time in prison if they are convicted of the crime while out on bond. This is under a proposal that is heading to Governor Henry McMaster's desk. So both Republican-led legislative chambers overwhelmingly approved a bill on Wednesday that would require the payment of a full cash bond to post bail for people charged with a sub subsequent violent or firearm-involved offense while out on pretrial release for their first offense. A conviction on the subsequent charge, even if they are not, even if they are found not guilty of the initial crime, would allow another penalty carrying up to five years imprisonment that could run concurrently or consecutively. So that's right. Even though people might be found not guilty on their first crime, they can still face enhanced punishment on the second crime. The full cash bond on the second violent charge could still be paid through a bail bondsman, but any bonds for additional charges would have to be posted by the defendant themselves. So this is something Henry McMaster is pushing for. They want to close the so-called revolving door of this small number of people who continually commit much of the state's violent crimes. You know, they get out of jail on bond or whatever reason and then commit more crimes. Makes sense. I think we are all like, yeah, OK, well, yeah. But opponents have said that these bond restrictions favor wealthy defendants who have the money to pay full cash and would disproportionately uh, impact poor defendants that uh, you know are going into jails and are unable to get out, and that makes sense as well. We've already we already see that now with wealthier, more well-to-do people have the means to you know post bond and get out on crimes. Where you I'm sorry, get out on bail. Whereas some people who are charged with the same crimes just don't have the money and therefore are stuck in jail until they can either get the money they need or until they go to trial and 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 if they're found not guilty, can then finally leave. 
Opponents have also argued that the additional five-year penalty undermines the presumption of innocence, which is kind of what I was alluding to before, where you're getting this extra penalty, but you haven't even been convicted yet. You're supposed to be guilty in the proven guilty until proven innocent. Plus the whole <laughs> the whole part about if they're found not guilty on the first crime, these enhanced penalties are still in place regardless. House Minority Leader Todd Rutherford, who is actually a criminal defense attorney in Columbia, noted that the deplorable conditions at local jails, and we've talked about that on this podcast before, you know, are another reason, like, do we really want to keep people in jail, you know, especially when our a lot of our local jails are really not up to par, uh, and they're not up to snuff, as it were, um, and, and to the point that we've seen multiple wrongful death lawsuits against these jails and some of their medical providers. The Democratic representative also raised concerns that law enforcement officials could abuse the statute by, you know, trumping up charges for people who are awaiting trial who haven't even been found guilty. So despite those objections, it's going to definitely be signed by McMaster. This was one of his big priorities. And, you know, again, it's one of those things where it, it, we do need, you know, well, in many ways, <laughs> we need some reform. And, and this is. I do agree that there are some cases that you see in the news when you you see someone commits a crime and they're already out on bond for another violent crime. And you're like, how can this be? So I get it. There needs to be something done. But I also understand um, Representative Rutherford's concerns, especially when it comes to, you know, certain people just not being able to pay those bonds. And, you know, you never know, like he said, if, if something could be trumped up charges that are just going to keep them in jail. You know, we've you've probably heard the term before, like you're in jail for being poor, basically, because you can't afford to pay your bond. Or if there's fines or things that you can't pay, you get stuck, stuck in jail. And how the heck are you supposed to get money or, or anything when you're there? So I get the concerns. I also get the need for some change. You know, we'll see how this works out. Um, and, and hopefully we can find a, a better balance in the future. Keeping it with local politics, South Carolina legislative special interest caucuses can now formally campaign. This is based on a federal judge ruling on Tuesday, and this is going to be a victory for this ultra conservative group of state representatives that wanted to push the Republican controlled legislature further to the right. The order allows the South Carolina so-called Freedom Caucus to fundraise and distribute election materials just like the House Republican, Democratic, Black, and Women's Caucuses already do. You may remember we talked about this before. Only certain caucuses are allowed to fundraise, and it was you know each party, and then they've also you know for different groups, minority groups uh, especially. So that's why there is the Black Caucus that can do fundraising and the Women's Caucus that could as well. But this conservative faction um, had argued that a state ethics law that limits those abilities only to those types of caucuses uh, violated its freedom of speech. And apparently the judge agreed. Now, for those who aren't familiar, this Freedom Caucus, this ultra conservative group, um, the best way I can put it is they've gained influence and probably got elected to office, whether if it was over a Democrat or a more like central or a more centrist Republican candidate, because they really dig in on these divisive social issues. And it's worked uh, for a lot of them. And guess what? Now that they have the same uh, opportunities to fundraise and, you know, put out advertisements or put money into the coffers of someone they want to help get elected, those efforts are just going to continue to increase and just be in our face even more. Now, why, besides they wanted to raise money, get this Freedom Caucus, you know, they're trying to get influence and kind of overtake the Republican establishment. So, yeah, that's the other thing here with this story. It's not just like a Democrats versus Republicans thing. This is Democrats and like the the more establishment, more centrist, more traditional Republican Party that did not want this Freedom Caucus to have this ability because of how far right they are. And that group said that the statute, the original statute, favored those ruling parties and arbitrarily disempowered others. Now, special interest caucuses had previously only been able to solicit money for the cost of like mail and, and conference attendance, but now they're going to be able to use it for so much more. And as I mentioned, this isn't just party versus party. A Republican, State Representative Michael Micah Kasky, uh, was actually named as part of this lawsuit because they claim he's part of this establishment, but he is 
just as upset as you know anyone else would be, saying that the judge, quote, blasted a hole in our state ethics laws, end quote. Now, Kasky fears that because any two legislators can form their own special interest caucus, like, there, yeah, there really isn't any set rules. It could just be two people. He fears that the ruling will open the door for state lawmakers to raise undisclosed funds in coordination with their campaigns. So the concern there is the so-called dark money. You know, when you don't know where this money is coming from, whether it's from, you know, uh, political action committees, PACs, and, you know, ways that people can hide donations so they could give more money than is traditionally allowed. And, and, and Kasky, although these guys are in his, you know, his own party, he's worried that there's going to bring in more dark money and this is going to sidestep our current campaign finance laws. Just as an FYI, the lawsuit isn't just like this, you know, in the South Carolina bubble. There, this had backing nationally. Uh, specifically from a group called America First Legal, which is a legal group founded by Stephen Miller, um, who is a previous White House advisor, and I'm pretty sure is a gargoyle, um, former White House advisor to President Donald Trump. So that should tell you everything you need to know about this measure and the folks behind it. Regardless, a lot of people were were probably like myself thinking this lawsuit was going to go nowhere. But when it comes to judges these days in conservative states or in our Supreme Court, for that matter, uh, you just never know where these rulings are going to go. So, as I mentioned, because the so-called Freedom Caucus will now have the ability to fundraise specifically for themselves, you can expect all these ridiculous, you know, um, culture wars and divisive social issues to just explode and be even more in your face. So buckle up. I had so much more to get to today, but we're going to have to postpone it till Monday or maybe even later next week, depending on how many stories happen between now and Monday. Um, at this point, uh, real quick, I am uh, going out of town on a bit of a break. The plan is still to have the podcast come out on the three days as normal. Just a couple things I have to test out, which I think will be fine, but there is that chance that something could fall through. But the plan is no changes in the schedule next week. If there are any changes, you know, I'll be sure to share on Twitter, Facebook, or my website as it, you know, however it applies best. And, uh, and of course, if I don't talk to you next week, the week after, I will return with all the updates. But the plan is three episodes as normal, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday this coming week. Regardless, have a fantastic weekend. Go to holycitycenter.com slash events to find some plans. You can also support this podcast by liking, subscribing, rating, reviewing it on whatever platform you're listening on. You can also go to holycitycenter.com slash shop to pick up merchandise or go to patreon.com slash holycitycenter to sign up for one of those um, support tiers that are available. I want to thank Cole Collins with LMC Sound System for producing this episode of Holy City Center Radio and Tyler Boone, whose music you hear in every episode of Holy City Center Radio. And most importantly, I want to thank all of you for listening and supporting the podcast and the website. I greatly appreciate it. I hope you have an incredible weekend. I can't wait to talk to you on Monday. Until then, good night and good luck. <laughs>